It concerns of overcrowding on TTC buses. I would say I'm on a, on a fairly crowded bus at least once a week. Calls for the TTC to do more after these startling photos were posted on social media showing large crowds and a lack of physical distancing on their buses. Plus, are they rescheduling me? Am I supposed to go to a pharmacy and book a, another vaccine? Confusion and frustration as thousands of vaccine appointments in Toronto get canceled at the last minute. The problem, a lack of supply and all the work online, you're not used to it, so it's kind of hard for me that way. The devastating toll the pandemic is having on children and teens and the long-term impact it could have on their mental health, according to the experts. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Well, photos of overcrowded TTC buses have been popping up on social media this week, showing people standing shoulder to shoulder with little or no physical distancing. A one rider whose post got a lot of attention says it's a regular occurrence. Our Greg Ross is live for us tonight on Bloor Street, the route that this rider get, takes to get to work every morning. So Greg, what has been the fallout from all of this? Well, Calda, that post that that man put on social media got the media's attention. And of course, we took it directly to the TTC and the city to get reaction from them. I also had a chance to speak with the man who posted that picture from the crowded bus to get his reaction. Uh, he told me that he has some concerns for his health and safety, especially with COVID-19 cases on the rise. It's honestly frightening. This is what Daniel Monick's ride to work looked like earlier this week. He takes the 300 Bluer Danforth bus into Etobicoke at about 4.30 every morning to get to his job at a meat production facility. I can do it in about an hour and 15 if I'm lucky. That's a long time to be standing on a bus, shoulder to shoulder, with COVID-19 spreading at the highest rate we've seen during the pandemic. And Monick says not everyone is following health and safety guidelines. There's always someone not wearing a mask. He admits it's not an everyday occurrence, but says it happens far too often. I would say I'm on a, on a fairly crowded bus at least once a week. Other riders have also taken to social media to post photos of overcrowded buses. We're trying to keep it to, to around half full. Uh, we're doing that around 95% of the time. TTC spokesperson Stuart Green says for the most part, buses are not overcrowded, but when they are, he says social media posts like this are actually welcome. They are helpful to us in that they, they can inform where we put extra service, and we have been doing that. He says they've also been collecting their own data to determine the areas and times that are busiest so they can put extra buses on those routes. Today, Toronto's Medical Officer of Health said there are things people can do to protect themselves in those situations. Given that the weather is a little bit better, uh, certainly opening up windows on the buses will help and obviously uh, maintaining distance to the greatest extent possible and using a well-fitting mask are going to be in important components of, of measures for self-protection. Green says the TTC also has new technology that might help alleviate some of the congestion. On Friday, we're launching uh, new features with the Rocket Man and the transit apps that will allow people to, through those apps, they'll be able to see how full a bus is. So they'll get an indication if the next bus that's arriving is very busy, they can make that choice whether or not they want to wait for the next one. Now, the man who posted that picture tonight uh, tells me uh, that waiting for the next bus uh, is not always the best answer. He says he does use those apps, but he says waiting for the next bus means he could be risking being late for work. And he says he can't afford to do that. And he says there's also no guarantee that waiting for those buses uh, are not going to get crowded along the ride. Uh, so he says uh, he could find himself in a worse situation if more and more people continue to get on. So he gets onto the bus, the first bus that he can get onto. He says what he really wants, he wants to see the city start uh, opening the, the subway earlier in the morning. But that, of course, Kelda, is a whole other story. All right, thanks, Greg. That is our Greg Ross reporting live for us tonight. And there's a lot of confusion and frustration tonight after thousands of COVID-19 vaccination appointments were canceled by some hospitals, others stopping registrations for now. Now, the reason, a shortage of supply. All this as the province's case count jumped back up to more than 4,100 today with a record 642 patients in the ICU. Our Lorena Redekop has more. This vaccination clinic closed, one of two run by Scarborough Health Network. 10,000 appointments over the next week, cancelled at the last minute. Do I now go and 
start rushing around and look at a hundred different uh, pharmacies to go get a vaccine? Or do I wait? Or again, you can see where the problem is. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do. The province blames delays with the Moderna vaccine. Last week's shipment of 300,000 is still not here, and next week's with half a million doses now only set for the end of the month. This ER doctor wants the premier to intervene for an area with a 24% test positivity and more hospitalizations and deaths than other regions. Call up our hospital, find out what the problem is, and give us the vaccine that just arrived within the last 48 hours. Other hospitals are also running out, with a similar message from North York General, East Toronto for its Thorncliffe Park Community Clinic, and the University Health Network, pausing registrations for people under 50. The head of UHN suggests both the federal government and the province send more vaccine to areas with the most transmission. People living in different parts of the province would say, I don't pay a differential tax rate. I want the same service as the person in that zone. The difference is that zone is not on fire. This zone at the moment is on fire. He says UHN is only allocated 4,000 more doses over the next two weeks. The province seems unlikely to change its strategy. I do not believe that the solution is to pull vaccines away from other communities. We just need more supply. Well, good afternoon, everyone. The Premier also blamed supply as he reacted to the cancelled appointments in Scarborough. They were hoping it would come in, so I, I don't blame them for overbooking 10,000 appointments. I don't blame York for doing that as well. Uh, we were expecting the shipments to come in and uh, unfortunately uh, we just we never ended up uh, getting them. For that hospital's clinics they plan to change how they approach bookings. Waiting till the vaccine's in hand we're going to have to really take a hard look at that uh, because it's it's very distressing for patients. Not all clinics are running out. Some pharmacies are reporting that they have extra doses. That's for people 55 plus with AstraZeneca. And the City of Toronto says its supply of Pfizer should last until the next scheduled shipment in a week. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Firefighters in Hamilton battled a three alarm fire at a senior's home tonight. This is the scene as crews work to douse the flames coming through the roof. It happened at Stony Brook Apartments in the Stony Creek area. Thankfully, all residents were evacuated safely and there are no reports of any injuries. Hamilton Fire says the damage, though, is extensive. Let's go now to our meteorologist Colette Kennedy with a first look at the forecast. And Colette, we saw a bit of the sun this afternoon. Yeah, it was really nice. And again, this morning, obviously, we had that dense fog, but then we got into the sunshine and some nice conditions, nice temperatures as well. But now we're starting to see some of those showers, spotty showers making their way in. And of course, we've had the clouds kind of thickening up. So that's what we're dealing with through the overnight hours, some scattered showers. Tomorrow morning, we'll probably have a little drier period, but still a lot of cloud cover. Might be some slivers of sun, especially closer to the lake shore. And into the afternoon, yeah, the showers. You see that rotation around the system as it moves in so the showers return to us and we're going to keep with this unsettled pattern and there's even going to be a risk uh, for thunderstorm you know, too into southwestern Ontario but we keep this pattern even as we go into Friday so I'm going to go into a little more detail on that and we'll talk about the weekend coming up but tonight your temperatures look like this six degrees will be the overnight low and then tomorrow especially in the afternoon there'll be some spots a little wet tomorrow morning for the commute but especially it's the afternoon commute where things may be going a little slower. Nine degrees will be the high, Kelta. All right, thanks, Colette. For the second year in a row, you'll have to check out the cherry blossoms in High Park virtually. The decision was made due to the high number of COVID-19 cases in our city right now. While the park itself will remain open for cyclists and pedestrians, access to areas of the park with cherry blossom trees will be restricted during their pre-bloom and peak bloom periods. Instead, the city is offering a live stream of the event so you can watch it safely at home. The mayor says last year some 200,000 people tuned in. Well, we are now well into phase two of the vaccine rollout, but many essential workers are still wondering when they will see vaccine clinics set up at their workplaces. The province says it's in the midst of working out all the logistics with the help of local public health units. And as Ali Shiasan reports, that's frustrating the Brampton mayor. 
vaccinate essential workers, vaccinate essential workers, vaccinate essential workers. Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown says he and a lot of companies are ready to go. Last week was a great relief that we were going to focus on hot spots, that we were going to focus on essential workers. But he says momentum has stalled. We need to see details on how we're going to get there. While his inbox floods with emails from companies asking for more info on how and when they can vaccinate employees. Magna uh, said they've got literally thousands of employees in Peel. They will bring in their own uh, physicians and nurses as long as they get the vaccines. Canadian Tire Distribution Centre, Amazon, the list goes on and on. There's little public information available on which companies or industries will see clinics pop up in their parking lot. Toronto's Medical Officer of Health says they're still in the pilot stage. Looking specifically at workplaces, uh, the Toronto vaccination partners have agreed to pilot some workplace clinics to determine whether that's worth scaling up further. So do stay tuned. It would be nice to know that my staff could be protected. Austin Muscat says it's like the cart being put before the horse. He runs a food processing company in a hotspot region of Toronto. One COVID case shut down his whole production line. When last week's announcement was made about people living in hotspots, he surveyed his staff and... Only 10% of our staff live in hotspot postal codes that would be eligible for the vaccine. And of those, several of them are under 50, which right now we're in a wait state for that age group. So the company is pretty unprotected, I would consider that. People who work but do not live in hotspots technically can attend the mobile clinics that have been popping up in those areas and receive a vaccine. Would they have to provide pay stubs? Would they have to have proof from the employers? Would the company register uh, their business and provide a list of their employees? There's no guidance from the province on how this would be achieved. Good questions, not many answers. Just more critical details lacking from the current plans. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. With school closures, not being able to see their friends, and adjusting to online learning, the pandemic has been really tough on children and teens. And as our Jessica Ng reports, doctors say it will have many long-term consequences for young people. It's really hard for me. Seven-year-old Chloe Louis Smith says the toughest part of the pandemic has been adjusting to changes at school. Well, you have to write a lot of things now, and it's kind of bugging my fingers. And her eyes. She says she also really misses seeing her friends. Her mother, Sharon, describes her as a social butterfly. She's done well, uh, given the situation. I mean, it's, it's kind of tough, for, especially for seven-year-olds, to be constantly flipping and flopping from in-school to virtual, in-school to virtual. Idea. Equating to shifts in kids' social circles, according to sociology researcher Amber Gazzo. That kind of transition back and forth that they've experienced now a few times, the, their social interactions that, uh, that they come to rely on, come to see as important to their lives, keep changing. Doctors say there are alarming pandemic trends for children. Dr. Saba Merchant, a Vaughan based pediatrician, says current prevalence of anxiety and depression in kids is at roughly 40%. I think we are seeing the tip of the iceberg only at this point, so I, I have a feeling this is going to last much longer. Dr. Daniel Rosenfield of Sick Kids Hospital says it's especially worrying for teenagers. We know that the last year we've seen approximately 25% more of these uh, kind of suicidal ideation or suicide attempts present to our emergency department. The doctors say the solution for kids is the same as everyone else, vaccines. My hope is that uh, we will actually um, give emergency approval to the Pfizer and hopefully Moderna if the data looks satisfactory for the 12 to um, 18 or 12 to 15 age group and that we will be starting that very shortly so that these kids are vaccinated going into um, school by September. Followed by kids under 12 by winter. Experts say the best thing parents can do is to regularly check in with their kids discuss how they're feeling and let them know they're not going through this pandemic alone. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. There seems to be an escalation, an escalation in the amount of questions, an escalation in the type of treatment. A new report finds Black and Indigenous people are overrepresented in Toronto transit enforcement incidents. And when it comes to why, racial bias cannot be ruled out. We'll have that story after the break.
Welcome back. An independent review has found black and indigenous people are much more likely to be cautioned or charged while riding the TTC. The transit agency commissioned a report which was presented to the board today. Angelina King has more on the findings. An in-depth report looking at TTC enforcement shows Indigenous people are about four times more likely to be the subject of enforcement compared to their white counterpart, while Black people are more than twice as likely. This is what's being um, uncovered in 2021 when these types of things have been happening for a long time. Caitlin Casper says her clients are often targeted more than other groups and... There seems to be an escalation. Um, an escalation in the amount of questions, an escalation in the type of treatment, um, and I think an escalation in the sanctions as well. The data was collected over an 11-year period beginning in 2008. It examined more than 86,000 enforcement-related incidents on the TTC when race was reported. The report found while Indigenous residents make up less than 1% of Toronto's population, they had the highest enforcement rate per 100,000 people. Black people who make up under 9% had the second highest rate, while white residents who make up about half the population had a much lower enforcement rate. These dis racial disparities are likely a product of a variety of factors, uh, conscious and unconscious bias, uh, both on the part of individuals as well as uh, decisions at a more systemic level. The researchers say other things must also be considered, including broader inequalities. Due to things like poverty, for instance, um, you know, some groups may uh, be more likely to, to e evade TTC fares. The report recommends the TTC improve training and policy and do a better job collecting, analyzing and sharing race-based data since many of the interactions reported are missing that information. The TTC says it's taken the report to heart and has already begun making changes to its culture and policy. It's really to think about when we have these findings, how does it show up in every single business line within our cooperation so we live what we commit to which is really embracing diversity the researchers work isn't done next they'll be hearing directly from affected communities and ttc riders then they'll put together a report with final recommendations on race-based data collection and eliminating bias from the ttc angelina king cbc news toronto boucher <laughs> from quebec city the Raptors taking on the San Antonio Spurs tonight at home in Tampa, facing off against a familiar face, DeMar DeRozan. Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet are still out of the lineup, but the shorthanded Raps got it done. They were in the lead at halftime and kept the momentum going, taking this one 117 to 112. Breaking ball high in the air. Hicks ranging back at the wall, at the track. Get out of here! An afternoon game for the Jays, wrapping up their series with the Yankees. Bo Bichette hit a walk-off solo home run to lead the team to a 5-4 win. They win this series 2-1. It's the second time they've bested the Yankees this season. The Blue Jays are back in action tomorrow night in Kansas City against the Royals for Jackie Robinson Day. And the American Hockey League has postponed three Toronto Marlies games over the next week due to league COVID-19 protocols. The AHL did not elaborate on why the Marlies were entering league protocols. Makeup dates have yet to be determined. The Marlies' next scheduled game is April 23rd at Belleville. And cloudy this evening with patches of light drizzle that will continue into the morning hours. Currently 7 degrees downtown. All right, let's go back to Colette now with a look at the extended forecast. And Colette, it was nice to get a dose of sunshine this afternoon before the clouds moved back in with some of that drizzle this evening. Yeah, that's right, Kelda. Our pattern is changing there. We are seeing this system. The same one that brought the snowfall into southern Manitoba, northwestern Ontario, Winnipeg, 20, 25 centimeters since the beginning of the week. So it's the same system, but not giving us the same conditions. This is what you're looking at for your weather headlines. We've got the showers moving in, some slightly cooler temperatures than we've been experiencing for the next couple of days and also just a little bit below seasonal improvements for the weekend yes you're seeing 
some showers in there. There's a slight chance later on Saturday and even a slight chance on Sunday, but really we will be seeing drier conditions and more sunshine for the weekend and the temperatures kind of popping back up a little bit. Daytime highs today, boy, we did okay once we got into that sunshine and burnt off some of that fog. Early this morning near the lake shore, the temperature was only five degrees, whereas at Pearson, it was already up at 13. So that was kind of the contrast where you were a little slower to get out of that fog in that fog deck. So overnight tonight, yeah, pretty light in nature, but we get some of those showers. Slightest chance for some sun early tomorrow, but probably not. Just letting you know, I mostly see these clouds coming back in, a little bit of drizzle, but really into the afternoon, we're going to see a return of some of that showery activity as we get into the afternoon and evening hours. Could see the odd pop-up thunderstorm into southwestern Ontario here, and certainly some cloud covers where, well, now the core of this system is quite a bit colder. Like I said, it brought the snow in to southern Manitoba. Because of that, we'll see some cooler temperatures and maybe even a few little flurries tomorrow night into Friday morning into the higher elevations, cottage country, uh, that potential all the way back along the shores of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. So just be aware of that. Don't get too frightened by it. We're not talking accumulations. Tonight, your temperatures in southwestern Ontario, just a few degrees above freezing and then double digits. Windsor, Leamington, but barely and elsewhere will have some cooler air, especially Sarnia, like I said, closer to the core. Overnight tonight for the Golden Horseshoe, four to six degrees for those temperatures. And they don't change a whole lot as we get into tomorrow with highs of seven to nine degrees around the area. Friday, 10, and then there you go. Uh, things looking a little bit better as that system moves away. And we go into the weekend Saturday high 14 and Keldon Sunday up to 12 degrees. I like the sound of that. Thanks so much, Colette. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train.
today marks a significant milestone for the Tokyo Olympics with just 100 days to go until the opening ceremony. Officials revealed statues of the official mascots for the games to celebrate the countdown. Here's a look at the colorful mascots for the Olympics and Paralympics, cartoon-style characters named Miratoa and Somiati. Miratoa is the mascot for the Olympics, and its name means future and eternity. Somiati will feature at the Paralympics, and its name is taken from a type of cherry tree. Both were voted on by elementary school children, a first in games history. And that is our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Dwight Drummond has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night, everyone.